Hi, my name is Ben Helfon. I am the uh, co-author of Our Happy Divorce, How Ending Our Marriage Brought Us Closer Together. Uh, tonight's a special episode. Um, unfortunately, we don't have Kate, um, Anthony, who usually joins us, but we do have Susan Guthrie. And uh, also our guest is, and we all are now, in Tampa, Florida. So Susan Guthrie. You are a f temporary Florida resident now, correct? I know, for five weeks. I'm so excited. Tell us about why you came down here. Because I live in Michigan in the winter. <laughs> like That's all the reason you need. By March, you're ready to just like throw yourself off a snowdrift somewhere. So I need a little sunshine and... Now I get to meet you in person. Finally. That's true, and that's that's the most exciting thing. We've been, we've known each other for over a year, uh, and, and in this era of COVID and, and and Zoom and everything else, we've not met in person. Nope. Um, but but you know, there's a little resentment brewing that that you moved down from cold weather, and as you can see, I'm wearing, <laughs> I'm wearing a sweater. Wearing You're wearing a sweater. Uh, the temperature dropped below 60 I since you've been here. We had to turn the heat on in this house and we haven't been able to go in the pool. So yeah, it's been a little disappointing, I will say, but so, it's supposed to go up to 80 tomorrow. Oh, so. it'll be, yeah, this is a, this is, this is a cold uh, front for Tampa, you know, in, or for Florida it gets a couple of degrees below 60 and everybody flips out and, and then the next day it's 80. Um, so once again, you introduced us uh, to our guest tonight. Uh, he is a, uh, his name is Seth Nelson. He's a family law and, uh, and mediator right here in Tampa, Florida. So all three of us are in Tampa, but all three of us are not in the same room. Um, <laughs> Seth has been involved in thousands of cases as a lawyer and as a Florida Supreme Court certified family law mediator. With his professional and personal life experience and his sound legal judgment, he has a keen ability to bring common sense solutions to difficult problems. Seth, Seth understands that the legal system cannot solve all issues that families deal with in a divorce, and I can't wait to talk to him about that. Uh, that is why he hosts his own podcast, uh, and the name of the stream tonight, which I stole, um, How to Split a Toaster, um, which he gives non-legal practical suggestions for anyone who is contemplating going through or has completed a divorce. Episodes include Now You Are Alone, but what about the dog and post-divorce <laughs> dating? In his second season, it is available uh, anywhere you can get podcasts. So we are super excited uh, tonight to welcome Seth Nelson. Hello, sir. Thanks for having me. Love to be here. Uh, Susan, you and I are already kindred spirits. I went to school in Wisconsin. Oh. And then I moved to the Cayman Islands for three years because I had to thaw out. So I uh, welcome to Tampa. I hope it's a little warmer for you here. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, you get my pain. If you if Wisconsin, I think is worse than Michigan. So, so uh, Seth, welcome. And and you know, you, you and I, of course, Susan is the glue that holds this whole divorce community together. And and, and you know, she's always saying you need to meet so and so and and talk to so and so. And and you're one of those people. And we had a great conversation. And, and one of the reasons besides what you're doing uh, in, in your legal profession, but also putting out there is, one of the prices for admission, you know, is, is I like to have people with personal experience uh, around divorce. And, and, and you were divorced when your child was very young. Um, you know, sort of tell, tell us that story that you told uh, me, if you don't mind, and, and what your post-divorce life looks like. Yeah, well, happy to share it. Uh, my son was just two and a half when I went through a divorce. I was not a divorce attorney at the time. Uh, and my whole thought process through the very quick divorce that we had, I think it was all of three months, was that what is important to me is that my former spouse be left in the best position that she could and that the kids were going to be OK and stay in the school district uh, where they were going to school. It was a great public school district in Tampa. Uh, and, and those were my priorities. And I also wanted to have the chance to have a, a friendship with my former spouse. Um, and I choose my words carefully. As you know, I always say former spouse. Uh, I don't ever refer to her as ex um, because I think that's a derogatory term, um, ex. 
Um, and when I refer to her, when I'm talking to my son, I just say mommy, that was exactly, or mom, whatever you would say as if you were still married, I never say your mom, right? Unless I'm purposely throwing her under the bus, which I immediately follow up with to my son. You realize I just threw your mom under the bus, right? And he says, yes, it was pretty obvious, dad. But we have a, we have a great relationship. Um, her her spouse now is just a remarkable guy and I could not have asked for anyone better to be what we would call a bonus dad. Uh, cause I think step has a negative connotation. Um, but he is just a great guy. And my view has always been, you cannot have too many people that love your kid. And I'm fortunate that he does. I mean, that's, it brought, that's brought chills uh, to me. Uh, and it did the first time we talked. So I, I had forgotten that part about you not being a family uh, law attorney uh, before you're, uh, or you didn't become one until after. But um, h- how does that sort of shape how you can relate to your clients? Or what, did you go into it with a different, because of your experience? Or why family law? A lot of people told me that I would just be good at it. And like most lawyers, I thought, oh, there's all this emotional stuff, which there is, right? Divorce is wrapped with emotion. Uh, But I also enjoy helping people get through that. It's where you can actually help individuals, kind of like you're on the front line. Um, And then it does give you an opportunity to actually go into court and advocate if you need to. I always think that is not the best solution, but if you have to be in court, it's a way to get into court where if you represent big corporations or do civil litigation, a lot of it, they usually settle and you're helping companies. And I didn't have that kind of personal connections with my clients that um, I really enjoy just helping people through these very difficult times that they're going through. Um, so uh, before we get into this, hmm. All right. Well, I think we're back on. Uh, we, uh, anyways, sorry about the interruption, but but I was saying that I was having coffee with a friend of mine who was a family law attorney, and he was he was just he just got done with like a three hour discussion, mediation, whatever, with uh, a divorcing couple about an espresso machine, and literally they were fighting for two or three hours of over this espresso machine. Uh, and, and so is that where the splitting, where it does, I mean, look, they could have bought five toasters, or I'm sorry, espresso machines uh, with the cost that they paid both their lawyers and such, and, and, and just the ridiculousness. I know Susan has a story about Beanie Babies. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, that's part of where it comes from, but I always try to identify what are we arguing about and what is the delta? What's the difference, Okay. Now, it will be emotional. It might be. It's really not about that espresso machine. It's about either he wants it or she wants it. So now we're going to argue about it. It's the memories that you attach to specific items in your house that that you might be arguing about, which the legal system is not set up to deal with. The legal system is not going to divide an espresso machine. And that's where we kind of came up with how to split a toaster because it's the unsplittable. You can't do it. So why are you going to bang your head against the wall trying to do it? Let's figure out a different way to solve this problem. And that's really how I view divorce. It is problem solving. That's as what a lawyer you're paying me to do is to solve this problem. And there can be a host of problems between parenting and division of assets to alimony and child support and attorney's fees. And we could get into all the nuances of that. But at the end of the day, how do we solve these problems and get you through this as quickly as possible? Um, and rip the Band-Aid off. And I'll ask a lot of people, do you want to feel the way you feel now a year from now? The answer is always no. And then I say, well, then you have to make a decision. You have to move this forward or let me move it forward or get me the documents that I'm requesting of whatever those cases may be. So. Yeah, Susan, you want to add? Yeah, well, I always call it very similar to what Seth just said. I always tell my clients, that their peace of mind has a price tag attached to it and only they know the cost. Hmm. And it may be that they have to do something they don't want to do, like give up documents or provide information. It may be that they have to pay a little bit more or take a little bit less or give her the toaster or 
you know, it's I, I've I've always experienced the arguments over the big TVs. That has always been a major issue in many of the divorces that I handled. So, you know, I, I love what Seth said about being a problem solver. And the other part of that paradigm is that many of the problems are created by the party's emotional content, not, you know, you're arguing over a toaster. I don't care how much, how nice a toaster it is. It, it's not worth arguing over a toaster, but people will. And, uh, you know, I, they, my other phrase that I always say is the most expensive words in divorce are it's the principle of the thing. Yeah. Right. Oh, I've got a whole <laughs> principle lecture that I give. So I appreciate <laughs> where you're coming from. Yeah. Oh, but it's the principle of a thing. I'm like, well, I'm hoping, you know, that you have a very large bank account because principle is very expensive. And in the end, Seth already said it. The court system is not built to deal with those principles. The court system is, you know, they're not going to cut that toaster in the middle. They're going to give it to one of you. And, so when, and, Yeah, go ahead, Seth. Well, I was going to say on the principles, what never makes sense to me is I will never advise a client to settle on their principles. That's the core of who you are. That is unsettable. You don't move that needle. It's your principles. But paying a lawyer to go to court to get a government employee, the judge, to agree with your principle is a fool's errand. Because if they agree with you, who cares? It's your principles. Do you need a governmental employee to tell you that your principles are accurate or correct? Absolutely not. And if they don't agree with you, you're not going to reevaluate your principles and say, oh, maybe I got it wrong. What you're going to say is the judge got it wrong or the system is flawed. So I don't ever see a reason to go to court over your principles. Mm, drop. Yeah, that's a <laughs> yeah. that's a drop right you there. You have to use that one in the future. Very well done. Yeah, that's that's well said. <laughs> so so you you you've talked about this uh, the family both of you on this one the uh, legal system can't solve all the issues that come up with divorce principles. Um, you had mentioned some other ones. What are some of the other issues? Uh, where they're not set up and then where can people find solutions on their own uh, to those problems? One that I have is um, it's not going to solve the problem that children are going to put their heads down on two different pillows on two different nights. The kids are going to go back and forth. Now you might argue about how often or what days or who gets holidays, but at the end of the day, those kids are going to be sleeping in two different rooms in two different mattresses and two different beds and different comforters. And we've all been in hotel rooms and it feels different when you sleep in a hotel room. So sleeping in a different bed is going to feel different to your kids, just like it does to us. So a trick of the trade is talk to your former spouse. Let's talk about getting the same type of mattress, the same type of pillow, maybe the same type of sheets. And maybe that one little thing just makes your kid a little more comfortable when they're transitioning from one house to another. There is no court that I'm aware of that's ever going to order. You have to have the same pillow. Susan, no. you see yeah. any other issues that they're not set up for? And then what, what, what's the solution? If they can't find the, the uh, answer to, the, to those problems or issues, then, then where can people go and find them? Well, a couple of things. I mean, the, the one that I always run into or often we run into, I think, is where people are looking for justice in the court system. They are looking to um, have their their wounds licked. Retribution. Their, you know, retribution. And it's another aspect, as you were saying, as I said earlier, that the court system is not set up as that kind of a paradigm. Um, the flip side, and it's a great question, Ben, and people may not love the answer, but often where you, where you go or where you need to go to find the answers or find the, the resolution is actually within, because it really, you're looking for something that does not exist. You're not going to get justice in a courtroom. You're not going to get justice anywhere else if, if for the wrongs that were done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, often it's something that you need to to work on yourself. And, and we talk about this a lot, Ben, but, you know, it's, it's part of cleaning up your side of the street, what role you played in the demise of the relationship and 
often, you know, Seth, we hear all the time from people, why is my divorce taking so long? When you said yours was three months, I was like, oh my God, you know, whoever even hears about a three month divorce. Right, but when right. people say that, they're like, my divorce has been going on for a year and a half. Why is that? And I'm like, well, you know, have you done everything you were supposed to do? Have you turned over all the paperwork you were supposed to turn over? Have you done, you know, what have you done to move it forward? Because it's always based on, well, he won't talk, uh, you know, he won't negotiate or he's being unreasonable or she's doing this or she's doing that. So often the real answers are within you. So is it fair just really quick and then so that the answers or, or, or the court system's not set up to deal with anything on the emotional side of, uh, of the ledger uh, in the sense oh. that a lot of these problems seem to be the emotional variety, right, of the toaster principle or the cappuccino machine or the beanie babies or the, right. you know, uh, uh, or retribution or anything else that it's just not, that's not the place to find those answers. Seth? I agree with that 100 percent. And if you think about actually being in court, because if you're saying the court system and you can't courts, judges are there to solve disputes. But if you think about what really happens in court, the, you know, apple pie, Fourth of July, and we get our day in court, you don't get your day in court. Your lawyer gets your day in court. Hmm. In court, you are treated like a child. You sit there quietly, you only speak when spoken to, and when you're speaking, you're just answering a question. So why anyone would want to put themselves through that is beyond me, but people do it daily, okay? And I'm not talking about, you know, domestic violence cases where you have to go or if there's serious issues regarding children. I'm not saying that you don't need the court system and you don't need to have that avenue. But on the far majority of cases, if I have a really good lawyer on the other side, 98% of the time, 99% of the time, some a very high percentage, we are going to settle that case because we know where the parameters should be and we're going to advise our clients accordingly and then we're going to work to get them there to save them time, effort, heartache, money to get those issues resolved. But a judge is not there for you to cry on their shoulder. A judge is there to solve a dispute make a decision with the limited information they have and move on to the next case. Uh, and, and I'll just say this because I'm the only non-lawyer here and, and, and uh, neither is a lawyer, right? A, uh, a lawyer is not a therapist either. <laughs> you know, you can get, you, for not most lawyers, bad. for <laughs> most lawyers you can get, um, uh, for the, what they could charge an hour, a couple, ther a couple therapy sessions, not just an hour. Susan, you want to add anything to that? Well, I was just thinking of what Kate would be saying right now if yeah. she were here. So shout out to Kate. Right. You know, this is and this is why she and I, you know, work so well together because as much as, you know, I always say to my clients when they come to me with the emotional content that as a human being, I feel for them. I've been through the process myself. I've been through it with hundreds and hundreds of people over the 30 plus years, but that is not my training. And, and, you know, that's not what I'm there to do. But I love working with a client who is working with a coach, a therapist, a coach and a therapist to work through that because it's a great point. The, the court system is not geared to deal with the with the emotions. And honestly, they they are the you know, the aspect that turns the entire process into what can be, you know, the train wreck that that we all see at times, um, not always, but not everyone. Um, we know that the two of you had unusual divorces, not the usual divorces, unfortunately. More people are moving in the direction of understanding that there's an ability to have a different kind of divorce. But our court system, unfortunately, is set up to treat the restructuring of a family the same way it handles a rear-ender personal injury case or a breach of contract, you didn't put the right siding on my house or, you know, that type of case. It's it built, it's set up as an adversarial lawsuit, a dispute, like, like Seth called it. And it's not necessarily, I mean, there's a presumption that there's a dispute to start with. Many families, when they're restructuring, you don't have to treat it as a dispute. You could treat it as, to use Seth's words, a 
a problem or a reorganization that needs to be resolved or figured out, a problem that you know problem solving can be applied to, as opposed to this adversarial dispute that needs to be fought out. Sounds uh, like it could set up an, an, an apathetic uh, environment uh, that, that really without love. And that's the way it should be. I mean, it's a letter of the law. There's no like, there's no love for your children. There's no love for you, right? I mean, it's just, here's what it is. Seth, did you want to say something? Yeah, well, to Susan's point on that, when you're trying to solve these problems and restructure things, I think that you have to meet your client where they are when they are emotional. And at the same time, if you identify their interests on what they're trying to accomplish, it takes away the positional nature that people take. And what I mean by that is if someone comes to me and says, I want to keep the house, that's a position they're taking. My questions on that issue are going to be, why? Do you want to keep the kids in a good school district? Does it work for the busing schedule? Is it because... Um, they're going into their senior year and you don't want to move the house, but then after a house, you might be willing to sell it. What is the interest that you have that leads to the position? I want to keep the house. I'm just emotionally tied to the house. I love living here. We built our dream home. But when you start talking about interests and you say to your soon to be former spouse, I think it's important that the children stay in the house at least until X or during this transition. Therefore, I think it's best if one of us stays in the home. That's much different than I want the house. Yeah. Much different. It hits the ear different. It's not confrontational. It's focused on the children or what your interests are. And the other person could say, yeah, I, it's been my dream house too. I, I would really like to keep it. You know, and then you, you might still have to work through that issue, but you're coming at it from a much different perspective as opposed to, I want the house, I want the house, I want the toaster, I want the toaster. So one thing that I uh, read that you said um, is I tell clients what they need to know, even if it's not what they want it here. Uh, yeah. This way my clients understand the different potential outcomes and how we are going to get there together. So if you could just walk me through that quote, I mean, I, I love the quote, it sort of speaks on itself, uh, on, on its own, but how in practical sense or examples does that look? You get a potential client that calls you. And um, unfortunately in our profession, we have good lawyers and bad lawyers, right? It's very easy to overpromise that client. Yeah, I'll get you alimony, I'll get you this, I'll get you that even though you don't have enough information to give that anal legal analysis, you might just be wrong on the analysis. It, and then at the end of the case, when you don't get it, they're gonna say, well, when you first talked to me, you said that you would. So I actually got that from under promising and trying to over deliver at the very beginning. But when someone calls me and they've been married for a year and they're expecting to have permanent alimony in the state of Florida, I'm going to tell them, I do not see how that's ever going to happen. And if you hear a lawyer telling you otherwise, either they're wrong or they're a much better lawyer than I am and good luck to you. <laughs> I mean, so in, I've never had a client tell me that they didn't appreciate me telling them what they need to know because information is power in understanding the limitations of what may, what the outcomes may be help frame the entire discussion on how to solve these problems. So when you have two good lawyers and they understand, here's the outcomes are gonna be in this range, it's easier to settle a case. Sometimes I do have to go to court because I'll have a lawyer on the other side that is taking such unreasonable positions that I know the court is not going to agree with them. 100% I know. For example, in Florida, if they're seeking for a parent to pay for the adult child's education, college education, the court doesn't have the power to do that. But if I have a lawyer on the other side that promised that to their client in the initial consultation, I'm gonna have to go to trial and, and, and they're gonna have to learn it the hard way and waste a lot of money. So you need to tell the pe people that your clients and anyone else you're dealing with what they need to know and they will never be offended by that you can tell them, look, in this area, it's a little gray. This I'm really strong on. But that way, it helps define what the potential outcomes are. 
And therefore, you're not just reaching for straws or you have pipe dreams because that's where people get in trouble. So on those, uh, one of the reasons that, you know, I come on here every Monday uh, and do this is to educate people, right? It, 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 so at least when they take that first step or that decision, that awful decision to get divorced, uh, they, they know some steps they can take on the right. Now, you know that, Susan knows that, the law, right? How can people maybe look out, and, and I'll bring Susan in this too, how can people maybe look out and be educated? I mean, they're not going to go read a law degree, but to look out for the lawyer that's sort of promising the world uh, in, in, instead of, you know, what, what, what is real. Susan, you want to start with that one? Well, I mean, I, I think right there you said it all, right? If you go into a law office and sit with a an attorney who says everything is going to come out the way that you want it to, mm -hmm. then you have to question what, you, what you're hearing because very rarely does anyone, I mean, in fact, Seth, I, I don't know, have you ever had a case where a client literally got everything that they wanted in the divorce? No, and if they did, they would complain about the fees anyway. So <laughs> right. no. So I mean, there's it's it's not again that this is not a system that that is geared up to give everything to one side or the other. It's not based on that. In most states, it's based on equity, fairness. You know, other states, it's based on community versus you know um, uh, separate property. But it's defined. I mean, one thing that. I think Seth may agree with me on is very often when clients come in to meet with us, when we know enough of the facts, when we have the lay of the land, we as attorneys who have done this for such a long time, we kind of know where that case is probably going to settle. We could, within parameters, kind of have a good idea of where it's going to go. And it's never all one to one to the right or to the left. It's usually within some sort of, you know, range, and it may go closer to one end of that range than the other. But we usually know that. And I always, much to what, what Seth said, in an initial consult, one of the things I always say to clients is, you know, meet with some other attorneys, make sure that the attorney that you hire is someone that you trust because you are going to get information from your attorney that you don't want to hear. Mm. And you need to trust that the information that you're being given is what you need to know and that it's, you know, it's based in reality. Um, you know, I always tell them I'm not gonna blow a bunch of smoke up your skirt or, or pants. Um, you know, my job is to make sure that you're properly uh, informed so that you can make your decisions with that information, that layer of education. It's it, knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. yeah. Seth? I, I would add to that, Susan, and, and I know you do this by the way you just answered these questions, but I would advise clients to have, like if you're looking for a takeaway today, I would tell you three things when you're interviewing a lawyer. One, they should do more talking than you're doing. Because if you just sit on the phone and tell them their story, your story, you've learned nothing about that lawyer. So one question I would ask them is, what information do you need from me to start this conversation? Well, I need to know how long you've been married, how many children, what, you know, or do you have a house and a mortgage? Some basic information should not take more than three minutes. And then say, OK, explain to me the process. And that lawyer should be able to explain to you the process. I would ask that lawyer, what is the best way for you and I to communicate? And now you're going to learn about, oh, is it by phone, by text? You have to get with my assistant to get on my calendar. If there's an emergency, who do I contact? How do I contact? Um, what are your expectations of me as a client? How can I make your job easier and save myself money? How do you run your office? What person do I go talk to about what items? Or is it always that I talk to you first? So a lot of this is communication, but have those questions ready to go. And then you're evaluating different lawyers on how they answer those questions and how that makes you feel. I am not the right fit 
as an attorney for every client. And I'm okay with that. There's some clients that are going to want a female lawyer. There's some clients that are going to want a younger lawyer, an older lawyer, someone that maybe is a little bit more of a bedside manner that they prefer and they don't like my bedside manner. That is all okay. You need the right fit, but you need someone that's qualified and that you're going to be able to communicate with well and that you know that they have your back, not just on the substantive, but also in a ways to try to make the litigation less costly to save you money. Um, so before the uh, we went live, we were talking about the complexities of stimulus, the stimulus check and, and some of the things you're seeing. And, and, and I thought we'd spend some time uh, tonight talking about well, not necessarily the problems, but maybe so you explain the problems and then some of the solutions so it doesn't have to be spending the stimulus check on uh, Susan and Seth, uh, you know. Uh, Susan, you want to take that one? You yeah. want no, me to? No, I actually have not dealt with the issue. I've not had it come up as a problem. So um, the stimulus checks are distributed based upon income. The income is defined by your tax return and whether you have children. So if your former spouse, it was not their year to claim the child, but they did, they're going to get that stimulus check potentially and not you. And I've had that happen. So people are coming to me and they're saying, I didn't get my stimulus check. And right away, it's a stimulus check. The whole point is to get the money to people that need it. And I'm very hesitant to take that issue up because by the time I get involved, we're going to burn through the stimulus check on it stimulates your pocket. Yeah. Right. That's not the point of a stimulus check. Right. <laughs> so my my practical solution to that is let's make a note of that. If things are happening down the road that does require getting the lawyer involved, then let's deal with it then. It, the issue doesn't necessarily go away over a length of time it might, but or you just reach out and say, "Hey, I tried to get the stimulus check. I didn't get it. They said you got it. Can we split it? Even though you're not getting everything that you should have, you're getting some of it, and it's a lot cheaper. Even though I get it. On principle, you're right. But the cost of doing business is going to outweigh the practical aspect of that. And my heart just goes out to these folks because they need it. It's tough times for a lot of people, and I don't want that money flowing into my pocket. I want to just kind of table that if something else comes up, but give them some ideas to try to maybe get a piece of it now. So just so, so the pro if they, people alternate years with claiming dependents and it's 2020 or I guess it'd be, would it be 2020 would go off of returns or? Yeah, well, it depends on the package. It was 2020. Uh, well, originally uh, based it was off 19, of 19. Yeah. Because 2020 hadn't been filed. And then there was even an issue with 19 being filed because it got pushed till July. So there's all these mechanisms of it that really just. So whoever's it year it was uh, at that time uh, would, would get the check. Um, and obviously the problem is that that check is supposed to, there's only one kid <laughs> uh, or, right. or two, but let's just say one for the sake of argument and you can't. Sp so technically, or I guess, uh, I don't know legally cause I'm not, but, but, the money should be split anyways, right? Or if it's... Well, it, that's a good this question. This is where okay. it's outside my pay well, grade. That's why I have... Right. Well, oh. if the, it's not designed as child support. It's not designed to say, hey, if you get a stimulus check, it's going to the parent that doesn't have a certain income. So if you have a parent that is eligible for the stimulus check and you have one that is not eligible, like right. people wouldn't say, well, you should split that, right? But the point on it, is people need help. The stimulus check is there to help people. Let's not waste the money on the lawyers arguing over the money because then the money will be gone. And that is just a microcosm of what happens in divorce on a daily basis, whether we're talking about a stimulus check or not. But it's the perfect or example. Or a toaster. But it's a it's an exact amount of money, right? We we, we know what the delta is there. And so if, if this... I guess extend the aperture a little bit. If this goes, if they do spend the money, 
to go to court to, to hire you. Uh, courts, maybe this is an issue the court may be, be able to be set up for. What typically, in, in your experience, would be the outcome? Well, I would argue that, Your Honor, my client was supposed to get the filing on that year. The other person took it improperly. At the time, my client didn't raise an issue because she was just going to file it for the next year and, and let the chips fall where they may. But now there's been an added benefit to that. We've tried to settle this issue. It has not settled. That check should have come to my client, not theirs. We're asking for the money to come. And here it comes, right? We all know it's next. And I'm asking for attorney's fees because I shouldn't have to be here. So now we're going to try to put the other side on the hook. And then they're going to say, well, Mr. Nelson, how much are your fees? I'm making up a number. Judge, it's $2,000. Mr. Nelson, you just spent $2,000 over a $1,400 issue. Yes, Your Honor, and I'm sorry it took that much time and money. We shouldn't have even had to be here in the first place if the father in this case would have done what he was supposed to do originally. Like, that's how I try to make that persuasive argument. And then the judge says, well, Mr. Nelson, I'm making this up now. I'm going to have him reimburse it, but you're denied in fees. And then my client looks at me and I'm like, okay, now if it's on the day or a day where I'm like, okay, I'm going to waive your bill, then I waive the bill. So she got what she needed, right? But from a contractual basis, I did my job. I did my time. I even won the argument, which I don't get based on winning or losing. But, and that's why it's just a terrible system yeah. when the dollar amount is 1400 bucks. And I'm not making light of $1,400. $1,400 is 1400 bucks. It can go a long ways. You just wanted to stay focused on your kids. And that's another thing. I'm sure, Susan, I'll ask you, do you ever tell your clients, pay them a little more and not pay me? You can buy your outcome. Oh, I mean, I think I've said that more than, you know, anything else I can remember saying. And for some reason, it's the advice no one wants to take. Um, you know, it's, I think any good attorney gets to a point where they, they will say to their client, the, the money is flowing in the wrong direction here. The bills are, you know, racking up. But unfortunately, what Seth just described, it's about a very specific situation. But you could apply that fact, you know, to different facts. You could apply that that um, process that just happened to a myriad of different facts. I mean, Seth, think about the cases where, you know, the parties are supposed to share the extracurricular activities of the kids, the expenses for that, and the unreimbursed meds. And then three years down the road, someone walks through the door with a, you know, Excel spreadsheet with thousand, you know, a couple thousand dollars that are supposed to have been reimbursed. And they end up spending 10 grand to go to court to litigate over it because they can't agree on the 42.99 copay and whether it was agreed that Timmy take ballet. And, you know, it, it's I've spent days in court going over those sorts of records as opposed to just give him 23 bucks and be done, you know, just sit down and go over it and be done with this. Right. And that's, that's the principle the, and, of the. Right. And principle is expensive and, and it doesn't always equal common sense. And that's why I asked the question, the outcome, because I sort of knew. I mean, we're, of course, we knew you were going to win. Right. But uh, <laughs> well, only the, in my hypothetical. Thing. No, but, well, you know, but but the other point was that the bill for your services was going to far outweigh what stimulus check or what the toaster was worth. And sometimes it just does. And so I'll ask you this uh, that I, we, I ask every uh, uh, lawyer that comes on uh, on the show. Have you ever, at the end of a high conflict divorce that cost however many thousands of you know dollars and emotional wreckage, uh, had your client say thank you? I'm glad I had that experience. Not once about the actual experience or the money that they spent, or <laughs> right? No. Uh, uh, no, now they might have thanked me as their lawyer and being accessible, and right. Th I mean, those heartfelt thank yous. Are, are part of what keep me going, but no one has ever said, oh my God, I am so thankful I went through a high conflict litigation divorce process. Yep, Not Susan? Once. Oh God, no. Right. I mean, my favorite is, you know, the client who walks out of that final hearing saying, 
Thank you so much, Susan. You've been amazing. I appreciate your support. I hope I never see you again. And, be, and I hope they don't. You know, I, it's, I love to hear from clients a few years down the road about where their journey has taken them. That's wonderful. And I have clients who reach out with pictures of their new home or their new spouse or their new this. But what I don't want is them coming back into my office with that Excel spreadsheet of expenses or issues where they couldn't pick up the phone and speak to their uh, former spouse about a stimulus check that went to the wrong place or to the wrong parent or working something out. But unfortunately, when people go through the divorce process, in an adversarial manner through a litigated divorce, what they're trained to do is argue over things and call their attorney when there's a problem, as opposed to, and I know Seth's a mediator as well, when they sit down at a table or in a virtual you know, conference room, like I do my mediations, and work things out, they're actually learning a new way to communicate in the mediation process. They're learning a way to compromise, to work together, to put interests over positions, um, delve underneath the, I want the house, I want the stimulus check. And we see a lot less of our clients down the road with problems when they do a mediated settlement and they're able to work through it. So uh, Seth, maybe to take off uh, the lawyer hat for a second, and maybe this the, the hat is the same, but um, to avoid people from going through that high conflict uh, divorce and, and, and you know spending all that emotional goodwill and financial resources, uh, what did you do in the beginning? I mean, first of all, three months. I mean, I think Susan alluded to it. I first heard that, and you know, Nick and I, I thought we had a good outcome, but three months is uh, might be a record. But you know, what did you do? Uh, through the process, beginning the process, you know, the minute you you, you uh, d decided to get divorced, it, that set you up for the life you have today. Well, let me tell you, it still wasn't easy. There was all the emotional aspects of it, okay? But I think that my former spouse and I were both focused on the kids, um, and it wasn't about the finances. I my view was. Whatever it is, it is. Whatever we can do to keep the kids in this house, to keep them in a good school district, that's what I was going to do. Uh, and I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I've made mistakes. I've m made mistakes in co-parenting. I've made mistakes when I was married. I've made mistakes during the divorce. But at the end of the day, we were both solely focused, I think, and mainly focused on getting the best outcome for the children. And... Um, money is fungible it comes and goes um we were both willing to you know maybe live a lesser lifestyle because you're going to have a lesser lifestyle when you have two salaries in one house as opposed to two salaries in two houses so we we, we certainly did things that um that i think made it easier and then throughout after the divorce we both um, and this is really just credit to her, did things to help the other. Um, my former spouse does not like to drive. So I would always do the driving. I would I would do more pickups and drop offs or if I lived farther away or if he had an event that was a little farther, I, I was always happy to do it. I get clients to call me now and say, why do I always have to do the driving? And I say, why are you giving up quality time in the car with your kid? Right. It's how you look at it. I thought those were great times that I had with my son and my former spouse appreciated because she doesn't really like to drive. So there's little things like that that you can do for each other and for your children to have less conflict because divorce doesn't make kids grow up to be terrible or have tough lives. Conflict is what makes that happen, whether your parents are married or not. So the less conflict that you can have for your children, the better off they're going to be. Anything you had learned in your life or been through that got you to that point of, of you know, putting us, like you said, it wasn't easy. It's not, you know, people don't end a marriage on a winning streak. There are a lot of emotions right. uh, involved, but for you and your ex, I'm sorry, uh, what, former. What you, former. <laughs> Former. It's I need fine. to start adopting that. No, I'm going to keep on calling Nikki my ex. Uh, 
<laughs> there are other words I could call her, uh, but but I won't. Um, but it, it, to get to that point of, of putting your son first or uh, in moving through that emotional stuff between the two of you? I think I did a much better job um, as we... The farther in time we got away from the actual divorce and the hurt feelings um, and when she met this just great guy, I mean, all that stuff helps. Time does heal all wounds if you allow them to heal and if you can put whatever differences you had aside um, because it's not the kid's fault, right? They didn't cause it, you know? So, um, and I just think staying focused on that and knowing that it was so important to me that we had a positive uh, friendship and relationship. Um, her and her former spouse um, came over for Super Bowl because our son goes back and forth. So with COVID, we're kind of in each other's bubble. We all want to have a little something for Super Bowl. So they came over. We've spent Thanksgivings together. Um, if it's my son's birthday, we all go out to dinner together for his birthday. Um, we save each other's seats when we go to his events. Um, he just had a play, and because of COVID, we could only get four tickets all in our within our bubble. We went together. Um, and I think a child should never have to run off of a soccer field and try to figure out which parent to go hug first. So we would always be together, and I would always tell my son, give mommy a big hug. I would give him the direction, right? I'm going to get my hug next. It's okay. We're still going to get them, but those little things go a long way with your kid and your former spouse is going to notice those little things and each one of those makes it better. Like I think you told me, bring your former spouse a cup of coffee. You know how they take it. Yeah. He's going to like, it's just a nice gesture, right? Yeah, that was the uh, icebreaker. And I think it was Renee uh, Bowers. Bauer. Yeah, coffee with co-parenting. Or co-parent, whatever it was, but uh, and that was her suggestion. But when Nikki and I first met at the coffee shop, when I made her amends, the first thing I had there, and that's why I related so well to it, was a cup of coffee. I knew what she liked. I knew how, you know, lot, uh, I don't remember what it is anymore, but that's okay. I'm a, I'm a bad <laughs> former spouse. We'll find uh, out. But I know what my wife likes. But, uh, but I had it ready for her. You know, it was sort of like a peace offering, <laughs> you know, or like just right. to, that this isn't going to be, it's going to be hard, but it's not going to be, you know, that difficult. And I love what you said about the, uh, I think we, we had talked about this when we called, but that terrible situation that kids are in and, and I was in it, you know, and, and I can really relate to it as a child of a high conflict divorce of, of, you know, after a sporting event or who do you go over to? And the thing is, it's just not for a period of time uh, in elementary school right? Or high school or college or, you know, I've, I've had to deal with this of, of, of sort of work, navigate. Now my parents get along, which is a whole different thing, but, but of navigating the waters of my parents' emotional problems and their decisions from the age of 13 until, you know, uh, high school graduation, college graduation, first marriage, second marriage, like where's mom right. going to sit? Where's dad going to sit? And it's just, you know, so it's not just, uh, you know, until they're 18 or whatever. It's something and, that... And absolutely. And I think on that note, because I was sitting here as you were thinking about that, all the little things, I don't want it to sound like I was the one always doing the nice things. I would mediate a case and Susan's been there and it's like, I got to pick up my kid and it's getting late, but I'm, I'm here to get these people's issues resolved. We finally got the lawyers together. It took us three months to schedule it. I can't leave. Right. And my first call was to my former spouse and say, hey, I'm stuck at work. Not once did she ever say no. And not once was I like, oh, can I get a makeup night for that? Right? Like, it all comes out in the wash. Right. Um, and, and like you had to go through, you shouldn't have to negotiate who sits where at your wedding. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, you know, unfortunately, that's, the, you know, again, that's why we'll come on here every Monday night is to at least give people, you know, one hope, but also to give people the best resources on what to do, what not to do, what mistakes people have made so they can, you know, ha have the best possible outcome on a very, very difficult uh, situation. But, um, 
I know we're a little bit over, and I promise Susan and I have another, you know, lawyer that both. I know how much you guys charge an hour, so <laughs> I don't want to. I don't have to play time and a half because uh, if it goes after that one hour, I know you charge uh, the, the half an hour. But um, tell people where they can find your podcast information on you. It's it's a great podcast. It's a great name, um, and, and uh, tell us about it. So it's called How to Split a Toaster. It's a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. We really try to deal with um, things that you just don't deal with in court, whether it's an interior designer explaining how to set up um, your new home and still make it feel like a home when half your furniture walked out the door. If you were in 3000 square feet and now you're at 1500 or to set up makeup for your kid, for the girls at both houses. Um, what do you actually do with the dog? What's best for the dog? Most people think, oh, it's to stay with the kids. That might not be best. Um, so there's just a whole host of things that you don't necessarily deal with in the legal world that we're just trying to say, hey, here's some information. If it's useful to you, pass it along. And if it's not or it doesn't apply to your situation, go to the next one. Um, but it's wherever you get your downloads, wherever you listen to your podcast, um, how to split a toaster. And then to learn more about me and my practice, it's just Nelson Coster. That's N-E-L-S-O-N-K-O-S-T-E-R.com. And just, I cannot thank you enough for having me uh, on our happy divorce. And it's so refreshing to find kindred spirits with you too. Um, and Susan, you've been nothing but gracious with your time and it's so much appreciated. And anything I can ever do to help any of you or anybody you come in contact with, just just reach out and let me know, I'm, I'm here to serve. Well, thank you. Uh, and just if you're just tuning in for whatever reason, these are two attorneys. Uh, family law attorneys, practical, common sense. They do exist. Uh, we've wrangled them up. Uh, as uh, I'll turn it around on you, Susan, the unicorns of the industry, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, you know. well, I, and, but it's one of the things I love so much about this conversation is I, I called Ben and Nikki's divorce, the unicorn divorce, when they were on my podcast. And now, you know, Seth, I, I can, they're not the unicorns anymore. Mm -hmm. You had a very similar experience. Um, and I want to, you know, my goal in life and the reason why I come in every Monday to talk about these things is I would like that to be the norm yeah. as opposed uh. to the uniform for people. Um, and it's wonderful. I think one of the best things that can be done, and this is why I love Ben and Nikki so much for writing their book, is to let people know it can happen. And that, you know, I mean, Ben is very open about the fact that it didn't start out as the... Uh, the amicable divorce it ended up as. And uh, I think that just makes it that much more real for people, as you said, as well. So thank you. It, it, yeah. it means a lot when people come and tell other people that it's possible. And the human experience and the and personal experience and the, the, the you know, the, the uh, family law, it's great. Uh, Susan can be found. Divorce and Beyond podcast. Uh, divorce in a better way. Everything. Uh, it, Talking about great podcasts in the world, uh, she's got one of the best, along with Kate Anthony. Even though she's not here, we'll plug her. And for whatever <laughs> reason, if you want to reach out to our happy divorce, that's where you find us. Um, so, uh, where's Seth? There he is. Uh, yes. Seth, thank you very much. You know, three Floridians now. Yeah. Uh, Life's good. Maybe we'll all have to get together. But thank you guys very much, uh, and we will be back next week. Uh,